we were expecting to maybe get the same amount of value because obviously DeFi had a really big peak. But what happened more recently is that it got a lot of more traction. There is somewhere between, I think, 13, 13 uh, above billion worth of uh, value locked. Over the past years, the stakes are growing in terms of what we're actually having in DeFi in terms of value, how much we have to secure, and also how incredibly well the space is growing, still being very small. The reason Go exists today is, is because Aave had from time to time liquidity crunches. To avoid this crunches, we could actually have a protocol owned stablecoin that could be minted into these pools for users to borrow against. But what's important here is this liquidity premium is actually, and pricing the liquidity is the answer to these types of situations that happen in Curve because... Welcome to Epicenter, the show which talks about the technologies, projects, and people driving decentralization and the blockchain revolution. I'm Sebastian Couture, and I'm here with my co-host, Felika Ernst. Today, we're speaking with Stani Kulachov, who is the founder and CEO at Ave Labs and Alvara. We'll be diving deep into the recent Ave V4 proposal and what that means for the protocol, and also talking about DeFi and the future of decentralized finance in general. Before we do, though, uh, I'd like to tell you about our sponsors this week. This episode is proudly brought to you by Gnosis, a visionary collective committed to fostering and expanding applications for a decentralized future. Gnosis is at the forefront of innovation with Gnosis Pay, Circles, and Metri, revolutionizing open banking and creating a superior form of money. With Hashi and Gnosis VPN, they are building a more resilient and privacy-focused open internet. Are you seeking a robust L1 to launch your project? Well, look no further than Gnosis Chain. Enjoy the same development environment as Ethereum, but with significantly lower transaction fees. And with a robust network of over 200,000 validators, Gnosis Chain stands as a credibly neutral and resilient foundation for your application. Governance at Gnosis is driven by Gnosis DAO, where everyone has a voice in shaping the project's future. Join the Gnosis community today by participating in the Gnosis DAO governance forum. You can deploy your project on the EVM compatible and highly decentralized Gnosis chain, or help secure the network by running a validator with just a single GNO and low cost hardware. Embark on your journey towards decentralization today at Gnosis.io. Cars One is one of the biggest node operators globally and help you stake your tokens on 45 plus networks like Ethereum, Cosmos, Celestia and DYDX. More than 100,000 delegators stake with Chorus One, including institutions like BitGo and Ledger. Staking with Chorus One not only gets you the highest yields, but also the most robust security practices and infrastructure that are usually exclusive for institutions. You can stake directly to Chorus One's public node from your wallet, set up a white label node, or use the recently launched product, Opus, to stake up to 8,000 ETH in a single transaction. You can even offer high yield staking to your own customers using their API. Your assets always remain in your custody, so you can have complete peace of mind. Start staking today at chorus.one. Cool, Stani. Thank you so much for coming on again. I mean, I had to like talking to you two legends. Um, it's 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 always a pleasure. <laughs> Thank you. So we're here to talk about Ava V4 today. There has been a number of proposals that just very recently passed. Um, before we dive into that, um, can you maybe walk us quickly through the evolution of Ava V1 through 3? Well, yeah, it's, um, it's definitely been really, really, um, I would say, even a long journey. Um, so... As some of the listeners might might know, and um, I started uh, building decentralized finance um, in 2017, 2016, already kind of like thinking of ideas and uh, what to build and and what's important for um, uh, the ecosystem as a as a product. Um, and and what came out of that was was a um, project called uh, Ethland, short for uh, Ethereum. Uh, lending, and I had this idea that um, if you can actually swap assets um, on chain, you could also use those assets as a collateral um, and borrow against as well, and also earn yield. Um, 
the way I started was more of like a peer-to-peer setup in a market um, because mainly a lot of these assets were very low liquid and there wasn't this like, concept of pooling yet. But later with, with Uniswap and a lot of the innovation, pooling assets became a more of a common thing and um, we iterated into Aave uh, protocol, which is essentially uh, a, a pooled model where you can get liquidity, access to liquidity right away um, and then use whatever you supply as a collateral to um, draw, basically borrow any other um, asset. And the difference between what you pay for uh, supplying, sorry, receive as an interest as a supplying and pay for borrowing, the net is your different cost, uh, difference cost there. Um, and looking at each deployment uh, we had, I guess Itlen was more of uh, experimentation. I was still um, studying in university. I've, I've been I've been builder for quite a long time. I built FinTech and um, various uh, web applications back in the Ruby on Rails and Web2 um, uh, era. And uh, I think Aave protocol was something that evolved um, as a kind of like a ideal way of, of actually um, gaining on-chain liquidity. And when we launched, I, I think uh, our expectation was that maybe the protocol will have 10 or 20 million worth of value in the smart contracts and um, with based on like the TVL mimetic metric of uh, value locked in um, and ended up, ended up having several hundred millions. And by the V2, our goal was to basically create a better protocol and being more capital efficient, more um, risk management tooling. Um, and that ended up being um, what we expected to have maybe a few hundred million became a protocol that had a few billion worth of value. And then V3, which is our most recent uh, uh, development of the of a protocol from Ava Labs, um, we were expecting to maybe um, get the same amount of value because obviously DeFi had a really big peak. Um, but what happened more recently is that it got a lot of more traction um, again. And we have all these different um, network deployments that the community developers are um, deploying and Aave is now over uh, 13 different uh, markets. Um, there is somewhere between, I think, 13, 13 uh, above billion worth of uh, value locked. Um, so it just showcases kind of like how over the past years, the stakes are growing in terms of uh, um, what we're actually having in DeFi in terms of value, how much we have to secure, and also how uh, incredibly well the space is growing, still being very small, uh, but still exciting to see how things have been um, evolved. And that's basically where we are now. And the V4 is something that where we want to build a lasting protocol, which should be the last, like a major uh, iteration. But I give you a little bit of warning because every time we are building a new iteration, we think it's final and we don't need to do much changes. A year goes b- past or two, and we're still, you know, finding things that we can do better, uh, new innovation. And it feels like whenever we say this, we still have some work to do in the future. Ah, uh, Stani, you and everyone else, I think this has happened. This is what <laughs> happens to our bidders. <laughs> So um, let's quickly just say on V3 before we deep dive into kind of what you're planning for the future. Um, So you guys have a stable coin uh, called Go that works similarly to Maker's Die. Um, There was recently an escalation between Maker and Ava regarding the use of certain collateral. Can you quickly um, walk us through what happened and why it escalated? No, it's an interesting topic because... What happened factually is that from the maker community, um, there was an initiative to to actually use uh, Ethina's um, EUSD, which is es- essentially kind of like a on-chain yield fund where the collateral is in these different centralized exchanges, and you're capturing the uh, the yield of that um, that type of activity that uh, the um, the stablecoin had in the underlying uh, model. Now, 
Uh, the model is very interesting, and the project is extremely interesting um, and got a lot of traction, but obviously it's still very new. Um, and what we saw from Maker is that uh, there was this uh, initiative to actually mint uh, a lot of DAI against this collateral, um, which basically meant to the extent of a um, um, couple of billions of words uh, over the uh, short time um, horizon. So this is kind of like interesting because from um, Aave Protocol's perspective and the Aave DAO and Respanish perspective, holistically, the, the, the Aave DAO and risk management has to go and is seen through asset by asset perspective and risk parameter perspective. So this changed the risk profiling of um, MakerDAO, but also uh, specifically uh, DAI with this in initiative. So it's, it was a question of um, the conservative uh, DAI as a and, and maker as a system is basically taking more uh, opportunistic approaches and that risk should be repriced. And there was a lot of discussions in the Avadao how to reprice this risk and also signal of a uh, change of a risk profile within the Avi protocol and, and, and greater uh, DeFi community. And that was essentially like what what was it all about? Um, and I think that the, the, the actual question is that um, the, the, the underlying collateral itself uh, could be in Maker to some extent, the, the way it's, for example, to some extent in, uh, as of today, in AVB3, but it's a question of magnitude and risk profiling as well. So that's the kind of um, series of events that, uh, that happened. So Maker's deployments are actually just deployments of the Aave V3 contracts, right? So kind of, do you think the difference between Maker and uh, and Aave at this point is kind of just risk appetite in in terms of underlying collateral, or where where do you see the differences? Yeah, I mean, the tech that we usually build build from the Aave Labs uh, perspective, and and the tech I see in wider Aave community. Um, it's very uh, innovation driven. So even things like Go, uh, the underlying technology, Go stability module, and compared to what exists today out there, we usually don't fork directly code. Uh, what we do, we actually figure out things that are could be improved and, and innovate on, on top of the existing status quo. Um, so do you think that they vary different type of uh, technological risks and over time they mature especially more air pairs, pairs come so kind of like the the last bastion of risk um, and I think this just doesn't apply specifically only to Aave and, and Maker but in general the whole uh, DeFi ecosystem is is, is the risk management on um, the underlying assets so what is actually backing all that activity all those borrowings or, or mints of go or or die and, and so what is the kind of like a last standing uh, collateral there um, and I do think that makers risk profile has changed um, since if we go back in for example in a couple of years obviously D3M a module where you can print maker into different uh, protocols that existed for a while and that's been very useful for the Aave uh, protocol as well uh, but essentially what we the, the way to think about these two different protocols is uh, there's two different risk management uh, communities that are seeing risk differently. And this is important because uh, previously, um, you know, everyone was relying upon DAI and, and Maker and there was so much vested interest because it was uh, one of the main projects on Ethereum and DeFi, the main sta decentralized stablecoin. And now there's options. And, and I think this optionality is really important because um, it allows the the Aave um, risk management community to decide what direction to to take Go, for example, and monitor as well what direction the maker community takes, uh, die and reflect towards. Yeah, I mean, at the end of the day, it's all about communities and how uh, decentralized governance uh, decides about what risk parameters uh, you know the community wants to accept for. In this case. Um, you know, the the collateral types on their protocol, uh, yeah. Let's uh, let's talk about V four. I think this uh, is quite an ambitious uh, proposal to 
move, as you said, towards you know what might be the final version of of Ave. I, I have doubts about that. I think there'll be uh, further versions and, and possibly more innovation. Uh, but uh, yeah, what inspired this uh, this development of V4? And can you maybe just uh, uh, give us an overview of some of the main things that Ave V4 innovates on uh, with regards to uh, like V3? Yeah, I think two important, um, I would say, categories of, of innovation pretty much is consistent with, with all of these um, other protocol releases. Um, there is a focus on risk management and, and the tools that the pr protocol um, enables regarding risk management. Um, and the second is capital efficiency. Um, yeah, and, and also... Um, in V4, we have these two categories um, as well that we focus quite a lot, and a lot of these features are actually um, improvements of existing way of managing risks, uh, bringing more flexibili flexibility as well, uh, bringing more capital efficiency. Uh, but there's two additional uh, categories, and, and one of them is actually um, related to both risk and capital efficiency, which is a pricing component. So for example, um, given the way the Aave market is, is built, um, it's actually built in a really user-friendly way. So users can come and supply different kinds of um, cryptographic assets that are um, eligible and then pull the liquidity that they need. So effectively, you can utilize pretty much your portfolio on whatever you need to, to borrow, can repay it's really flexible the the, the experience there is um, relatively uh, simple um, but also intuitive um, and you don't need to go to separate markets and and kind of like you know put it into another place put like let's say uh, another asset let's say of it to another place and, and then borrow from here and here and monitor all these positions and <laughs> and and um, manage them right so so that's kind of like a one uh, uh, part of it. So, because you can do this, all this activity in one same market, um, it also means that um, whenever you supply a particular asset that is um, uh, yielding, so let's say you supply uh, USDC, um, it also means that you're earning uh, based on what users are borrowing that asset out. And it creates an interesting uh, scenario for the users because it means that. USDC is priced across the protocol um, in, a, in a one, I would say, price, regardless what is the user's risk positions, how much they're adding risk, whether they, they're not adding that much of a risk. And we wanted to change that. So we wanted to change the pricing in a way that it reflects how much risks uh, these users are actually bringing into the uh, protocol. Yeah, and that's the new category. And another category is the um, governance overhead. So the way we are thinking about the whole protocol, the architecture, um, it's more modularized. It, it means that you can fix different parts uh, without actually needing to upgrade the whole protocol, uh, the code base. Uh, it gives a lot of flexibility uh, there. But in this category, we also want to minimize the governance overhead. So how we actually can um, create, let's say, liquidity layers that are uh, immutable, um, or we can create different kinds of parameters that are immutable um, or time-based where they only affect from, from the moment a proposal gets into execution and new positions as, as an example. So these are the kind of things. And I think a lot of these new categories are really optimizing uh, the existing really good uh, product and, and also removing the overhead of governance, which basically means uh, maturing, the protocol is getting more matured and the technology getting, is getting more matured and reflecting to that. Right. And uh, we, I noticed you didn't mention the the unified liquidity layer. I think this is actually one of the most interesting aspects of B4 is uh, pooling liquidity from all of the different markets that Aave is present in. Uh, this is a, an interesting interoperability challenge, I think, that you guys have solved with um, this this portals product that you released some time ago. What are the main architectural challenges and and maybe changes from V three 
that folks will notice in V4 um, with this new unify, unified liquidity layer. And maybe we can then get into what the unified liquidity layer actually offers um, users. On a high level, um, without going too much into technical specific uh, specification, I think one of the challenges is that the Aave version 3 um, is a little bit built in a more like a monolithic model, um, meaning it all the main kind of like a ingredient, ingredients of the protocol are very interconnected. Um, and if you have significant changes that you want to change, for example, the borrowing logic, um, maybe you have changes regarding to, um, you know, a liquidation model, um, you will have to go kind of like into the core protocol layer and make those changes um, and upgrade a, a code base that might be affecting um, 12 to 14 billion worth of value in a smart contract upgrade. Now, uh, we haven't seen those type of upgrades uh, that many at, at this level, but as stakes are going high and more value is locked in, in these uh, protocols, uh, that is something what where we have to mitigate also risk. And, and the way we think about uh, unified liquidity layer and also this new modularized architecture is is that the unified liquidity layer is is a way to capture uh, liquidity into one specific um, like a pool or, or, or a layer, and everything else can be connected to that uh, liquidity. So that ranges from, for example, a um, uh, borrow modules that might differentiate amongst each other, um, updating the, the borrowed logic. Um, it can be a changes to a uh, liquidation engine different kinds of um, uh, modules that might affect. Might be also like a portal module that manages the uh, minting and burning A tokens between um, different networks for like a cross-chain type of a, um, um, a use case. And I think this is the yeah. fundamentally different difference between what we're doing in V4 and previous versions. So what we want to actually create is that... Um, as a, for example, community developer, you can work on a specific module, improve that specific module, or create a new module. And by governance process, it can be plugged into the architecture as well. And you can this way iterate faster. So you can change these different modules without actually affecting the whole uh, core uh, pool logic. And this also means that this allows institutions and other entities even create their own uh, liquidity layers and somehow manage them as well. Um, and this brings a interesting new opportunity for institutions, for example, to to create something on towards their own uh, use cases. Maybe let's go into detail as to how the unified liquidity layer handles uh, risk profile of assets across different uh, chains in the market. You, you were talking about risk earlier and how we risk um, uh, borrowing and lend, or sorry, how we price borrowing and lending on different assets. Uh, does the unified liquidity layer sort of create a like a single uh, price for an asset across all these different markets, or is there a way for users to specify and target um, certain types of assets uh, that um, you know may get them a better rate or like a worse off rate depending on what chains those are on? So unified liquidity layer, um, what's amazing about it? It's it's simply a it's simply a place to store um, value. Um, it, the the actual liquidity and and the accounting of that liquidity that who and which users it belongs to, and also um, there's a connecting points into these different modules. So it's it's as simple as that. Um, and you can also register your liquidity into a liquidity layer um, without actually supplying it and keeping it for example, in a uh, Gnosis safe, uh, as an example, which means that you won't be able to lend out your uh, funds, but you will be able to uh, borrow against. And it's something that is an interesting feature from um, institutional perspective or uh, mitigating that type of um, um, lending risk. But essentially, all these other modules, for example, uh, what is the interest rate curves, um, what are uh, pricing mechanisms and everything else it's is outside of the unified liquidity layer and they can exist um, 
obviously between different networks. And to give more uh, details about um, what, what what you mentioned, Seb, about the, the pricing, um, so we have this new feature called liquidity premiums. Um, and the way it works is that with li- liquidity premiums, you, uh, you as with your position, um, it's priced, um, it, the, the, the asset that you're borrowing is priced with the position that you create. So we can take an example where you create a position where you supply only EAT and you borrow USDC. So for example, today you will be paying um, a certain price for uh, USDC, but also a, a person that is uh, supplying, let's say, more riskier assets that are eligible in the protocol and borrowing USDC, they're paying the same price. So I don't know if you remember, there was um, over a year ago, this uh, uh, scenario with uh, CRV, where basically the Curve founder had a big position in, in Aave, and, and basically the DAO started to offboard the uh, collateral uh, by mitigating the uh, loan to value ratios, liquidation thresh- thresholds, and effectively the, the founder went to other protocols with which later today, as of, as of today recently, um, suffered actually bad debt because they, they took those positions to their uh, protocols. But what's important here is this liquidity premium is actually, and pricing the liquidity is the answer to these types of asset situations that happen in Curve because what you can do if, if a position is borrowing the same USDC and they're providing more risk or the market conditions, dynamic market conditions, changed uh, significantly, um, we can add a liquidity premium uh, much more higher. So basically, even if you keep the position in the protocol, you're paying more to the protocol and to the DAO for that uh, position. And then it's up to the user to to take that additional cost or living out of the uh, protocol. But this also means that actually, if you're just supplying uh, EAT and you have the most latest collateral, you're effectively paying much lower rate than the average because you are essentially having the, mo- the, the leanest uh, position within the same market. And architecture-wise, um, we are not segregating these uh, pools from each other, but it's still in the same market. And I think that's the beauty of it is that you can do all this activity on the same market, but we have a way to price the user's position based on how much they're providing risk into the protocol and whether there's sufficient reward for the protocol. How does this pricing work? Is it algorithmic or is it something that you kind of need an underwriter function for? Technically speaking, it's essentially just a delegation on the contract, which means that it can be a fixed logic. And that can mean, for example, certain asset could have a certain parameter, um, which is the risk premium parameter. And I think that's the way to start um, in the first iteration. But of course, because we have this amazing uh, modular architecture, it, it also means that that type of uh, pricing module could be changed to something um, or asset specifically. Change, for example, that reflects actual market conditions. Uh, so for example, if um, an asset um, uh, decreases in liquidity, that could um, automatically increase the the premium. And this is the beautiful thing about it is that you mitigate so much of the governance overhead of actually managing these parameters where they could actually be automatized between certain specific accepted range. How do you think um, the liquidity layer will benefit uh, Go? Um, so kind of if you look at the Go market cap today, it's about a third or so of the die market cap. Do, do you think it stands to benefit from from uh, this unified liquidity? Yeah. I think Go uh, is quite interesting because and Go as a kind of like a as a as a I would say like um infrastructure within of a ecosystem is is really fascinating. Um so when we think about Go in general and and, uh, and the benefits. The the reason Go exists today is is because Aave had from time to time liquidity crunches, and there was a, an idea that we had that 
to avoid these crunches, we could actually have a protocol owned stablecoin that could be minted into these uh, pools for users to borrow against uh, to avoid the liquidity crunches. And while we were thinking of this idea, we realized that actually one of the benefits of, of Go is, and compared to MakerDAO die um, back in the days, is that when you supply your assets to other protocol, you earn on the collateral while you're borrowing Go. So you have this kind of like a capital efficient um, stable coin. And on the Aave, Aave protocol's perspective, it also brings to the users predictability on their uh, interest rates, which is a great feature, especially when all the markets are on variable uh, rate basis. And when we look from the Aave protocol perspective, what's the benefit of, of Go? It's quite exciting to look at it because um, Go doesn't have uh, LPs. So you, at the moment, you don't supply into the Aave market. Go, it will change in the future uh, with Crosschain Go first in Arbitrum and uh, down the line also will be available in uh, in mainnet. But because Go doesn't have these LPs, it means that the reserve factor, which is uh, the way to collect um, Aave DAO revenue from the protocol, it's actually 100 instead of like 10 that is in USDC. So just to give you a magnitude of the revenue, um, 100 million worth of Go minted um, brings equal amount of revenue to the Alba DAO as 1 billion uh, USDC. And that's remarkable because that revenue then cascades into building and innovating more on the community side and on the technical stack and also figuring out different ways to, to reward uh, users. And in the V4 perspective, obviously with, with liquidity layers, there can be different facilitators that mint directly go on, onto these liquidity layers that can be then borrowed out. But we have in V4, we have basically multiple features that kind of like make the Go integration more seamless with the protocol. Um, you have Go soft liquidations, which is kind of a feature that the um, um, CRV USD um, pioneered. So basically you can soft liquidate uh, your positions uh, in, in Go and, and vice um, versa. You can get paid uh, interest uh, for example, in Go on any asset that you have. So that can be done um, directly under the hood on the on the protocol. And there's a couple of like technical improvements, but V4 will bring the integration between Go and uh, the other protocol more kind of like a tightly knit together. I wanted to ask also about the, the how this changes the UX or how does it improve UX uh, for Aave users so like maybe walk us through an example here. Um, like hypothetically, you have a user who's on uh, Polygon and has collateral on ETH L1 uh, and, and they want to borrow against that collateral uh, on Polygon, on, on the Aave market on Polygon or at least on the Polygon chain. How does that work for the user? And like in the background, what's happening to those assets? Where are they being sort of locked and more importantly, maybe like who's paying for the gas fees? Um, because we haven't talked about this, but the the orchestration of the unified liquidity layer, I believe, is still happening on um, on Ethereum mainnet. Um, so maybe just describing like that user flow and uh, what's happening in the background there. Yeah, and I can. Um, it's also like a the kind of like a subsequent. Uh, iteration of the unified liquidity layer, which is the cross-chain um, version of the liquidity layer with the portals. And what it effectively means is that um, the the Aave as a protocol can actually move liquidity uh, between these different uh, deployments. Um, and that can be iterated to cross-chain positions. Effectively, you could you could technically then uh, keep your collateral, for example, on um, Ethereum mainnet, for example, ETH, and then you can draw, uh, for example, Go on another network. Portals is just a, a simple feature of um, minting and, and burning um, unbacked um, A tokens that then are subsequently uh, backed right away. 
And the kind of like a key component of this feature is having um, caps of how much you can actually do that and, and what's the purpose. So the, the original idea of the uh, portals was actually to allow uh, third parties to come and get some sort of uh, credit line up to certain point uh, to be able to 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 use portals. Um, it, it's a tool for for bridging as well. We see um, the idea for for portals um, also kind of like an I'd say a, a way to move liquidity very fast uh, between net networks. Um, I personally believe that maybe most of the users will. Um, they might have their liquidity in one specific network, but you will have users that are uh, operating in, in, in multiple networks and it's going to be um, very useful. But for from like for, for me, like the, the, the most exciting actually um, UX part of, of the whole before and, and this works with, with the portals and unified liquidity layer is the aspect of the vaults. Um, and smart accounts, and and it simply means that, for example, if if you want to supply uh, liquidity, but you don't want to uh, supply the assets into the liquidity layer for some particular reason, one, you don't want to to get the funds lended out. Two, you want to um, uh, see the collateral segregated from the other parts, and and you want to keep it. Uh, three, you want to see it in your um, uh, let's say smart account. So what what we are essentially doing is that you can see your uh, you can you you can regis- register your collateral um, in the protocol, but you don't need to supply it, so you can keep it in your Gnosis safe, and then you can draw uh, the liquidity uh, against it. And and obviously this is like a really uh, interesting thing because you you don't really need to Put your assets into the to the protocol, and you can keep them segregated. Um, and this is also opens up some interesting institutional um, use cases as well. You can provide some attestation to uh, Ave that the liquidity is in a contract. It might be locked there. Uh, that that liquidity is that the the position is backed by something, even though it's not uh, in a pool on the protocol. Yeah, exactly. So that's the 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 key difference. Um, it's it's mainly of a kind of a, for for some some users it feels uh, more intuitive to see those assets um, in their right. basically smart accounts, and then you can still borrow without having to kind of like without seeing your assets leave. And I think that's a um, interesting thing. And then obviously using smart smart accounts itself is a big UX improvement because that enables things like, for example, gasless and signless transactions and a bunch of other uh, interesting um, things that can be built upon that even further. Cool. Um, Stanley, can you talk about the role of real-world assets in our V4? Yeah, there's there's um, obviously the, the, the segregated vault applies also to the uh, um, real-world asset uh, type of a use case um, and can be very useful uh, way. Maybe there's some sort of extension of like tokenization, tokenizing, storing in your own vault, borrowing against. Um, what I'm excited quite a lot about the um, V4 is that it allows to have with this new V4 liquidation engine it allows to have um, uh, liquidation strategies. So typically, the way these protocols are uh, lending protocols are built is that um, when when liquidations happen, there's certain rules uh, for that, and and that might be, for example, um, you have a liquidation bonus that happens when a certain price range is hit, and the liquidator keeps that portion. Um, it might be. Uh, Dutch auctions uh, as an example. But what liquidation strategies actually allow is that you can have a, a different type of uh, uh, liquidation strategy depending what the asset is. And why this makes 
uh, sense is that not all of these assets that will ex exist on chain will have the same uh, liquidity profile or the same uh, redemption um, time period or, or profile as well. For some and most of the assets that are um, listed today, their redemption profile is really similar where you can go and swap the asset on a secondary exchange and uh, replace it and, and you you created a successful liquidation, the protocol is healthy, but in more kind of like a real world assets, off chain assets, there might be, for example, a time period of like um, uh, two windows a day, once a day, every couple of days where an asset, for example, the underlying asset, you can redeem it, uh, liquidate it, take the proceeds and uh, return it to the protocol. So these type of uh, liquidation strategies allows to onboard um, this type of assets where, for example, you have to you have some sort of like a time component uh, involved. And that's where I'm um, very excited about um, as well. And of course, like combine that with the idea of segregated vaults, it's quite appealing for uh, an institution to to consider using Aave. Yeah, absolutely. So MakerDAO also has a very alive RWA offering. Um, can, you, can you compare that to kind of what you will be offering? Yeah, I would say that most likely, obviously depending on what direction the DAO chooses um, on the RWA um, to proceed with, but I would say that there's going to be a lot of similar uh, profiling, but with the the um, with the aspect of liquidation strategies, that extends to new type of uh, use cases or things that, for example, didn't exist as a collateral because you know let's say in institutional context, Bitcoin might be stuck somewhere uh, in a custody for another 12, hour, 12 hours, so you can't liquidate right away. Um, so those kind of scenarios. So I would say that what we're trying to achieve is that um, capturing the ability to technically support the existing use cases um, in RWA operations, but at the same time, um, innovating to support anything that is um, new or assets that that they don't have yet um, a, a similar support in fr from like technical uh, perspective. So there is going to be a little bit of similarity, but hopefully we see also new exciting use cases with RWAs with with the V4. And obviously, Go by itself is really helpful because that's um, Go works in a way that um, there is this concept of facilitators that can be created to to mint Go against some sort of a strategy, and that can be also real world assets. Um, that can be anything that uh, fits the DAO's risk profiling. Yeah, well, I mean, maybe taking a step back on RWAs a little bit here. Uh, which asset classes do you think are uh, most likely to really take off? in the next like six, 12 months and which of those like you think will have a significant impact on Aave markets? I would expect treasuries to keep growing um, and, and see more initiatives to bring treasuries on chain. I think um, there's a little bit of a, a slight stagnation of the growth because of the yield on chain is higher than what treasury is. Um, are providing at the moment, but it provides a really nice uh, diversification for anyone that is holding uh, a portfolio on chain, on chain yield portfolio, um, being able to earn on treasuries, but also diversify their yield sources and also risk uh, profile. Um, I think tokenization of money market funds is going to be. Um, also a, a growing aspect. Uh, BlackRock has been doing a uh, pretty nice uh, job there with the, the Biddle um, tokenization and in a, in a fund uh, that they have. So I would expect that growing quite a lot. Um, Centrifuge is, is doing a great job on tokenizing credit. Uh, I mean, they're OGs in the space and, and keep always 
um, iterating and, and bringing new um, assets on chain. Um, so I, I think those type of uh, short-term debt instruments are going to be uh, quite popular for the next, uh, I think, 12 months. Okay, Stani, let's uh, change gears a little bit. So you guys expanded onto a number of EVM networks with Arbor V3. Um, in the Arbor V4 proposal, you guys actually talk about expanding to non-EVM networks as well and kind of introducing a central hub for accessing Arbor and Go. I think the rationale why you guys want to do this, that's pretty clear to me. But can you talk about how you think you're going to achieve this? Yeah, so the way I think about it is that um, we'll see a lot of uh, uh, L2s where they're growing their own ecosystem and need a financial layer. And when you need a financial layer, you need the usual suspects, um, obviously on the DeFi side, for, for actually the technology, infrastructure, um, execution, uh, in terms of um, ongoing support, um, but mainly of um, being able to create a financial layer that supports whatever the use cases are on those networks. The way I think about these L2s and EVMs and non-EVM uh, EVMs is that they're kind of like they're they're all their own cities um, or like countries or durations and um, a lot of cities they actually need banks, financial infrastructure, and to support everything they have in their economy. Um, and that has been the case with um, Aave so far, and we have community developers that have been able to deploy across multiple networks with these um, EVM deployments, which have been like a really big um, uh, expansion. I mean, Aave is is um, uh, leading in, for example, in, in base, which is now focusing more and more on DeFi. Um, and it's amazing to see also Coinbase bringing like more and more of um, like their business or thinking at least towards um, an on-chain uh, future to some extent. Um, the way I think about non-EVMs is that it's kind of a expansion, but obviously you have a different tech stack. So, which is good and, and which is also like creates complexity. So good parts is that there might be things that are uh, helpful for let's say DeFi from security standpoint, um, for code implementation, um, but it's also a new language, a new implementation that requires uh, a lot of effort. And um, the way we think about expansion is that we can go so far with EVMs, but there's big communities around um, these deployments where which 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 exist in the non-EVM uh, ecosystems. Um, obviously, that means writing codes from scratch, um, and I think that's the way to uh, think about it. So we just have to think uh, these implementations we we have now. Uh, our EVM implementation and how to get it into uh, a non-EVM implementation. And it's obviously, it's not as easy as copying and pasting. Um, it's actually uh, a work of trying to figure out how to build in a completely new environment with a new language and whether to make that type of uh, uh, effort uh, in the first place. But I do think that it's really important to kind of like keep these options open and treat EV non-EVM ecosystems also as users that are coming into space. And then, obviously, that bridges into the wider Aave ecosystem, which direction to actually go. Um, there's also discussion whether Aave should be an L1 because just of the matter of, like, TVL there is. Um, I personally think that uh, there is argumentation behind of that, but I do think that Aave's roots are on Ethereum, um, and being able to support the Ethereum ecosystem, um, have Ethereum alignment, uh, is beneficial for for the Aave uh, protocol and the Aave DAO. But there should be bridging towards these uh, newer communities that are also focusing on onboarding uh, newcomers. And we just want to win in the sense that we get to see more of blockchain implemented into more mainstream and seeing more users. And I think that's how we think. But yeah, the hardest part is actually writing the code and ensuring it's safe. 
Yeah, there's there's a lot of like to unpack there. First, maybe uh, w- which ecosystems are are you guys like looking at as potentially being your your first steps outside of the EVM ecosystem? We've looked quite a lot um, uh, into move based ecosystems uh, and Rust. So those are the the kind of like main um, areas, um, and obviously that's where. Uh, our head is at at the moment so it's actually where and I think it's a lot where the future is going towards in in some sort of uh, frost direction Um, and we want to also um, ensure that we have enough know-how on trust um, whether it's an implementation or some sort of backend services we build um, and kind of like have that uh, approach as well but yeah I think there's going to be more um, information about concrete plans of um, how we think about the expansion to non EVMs. Right. So it sounds like it, it's it's not simply just a kind of copy paste deployment, but there's more thoughtful consideration as to you know the specificities of those VMs. Because I mean, on like on Movement, for example, uh, Movement does have like an EVM interpreter that it converts down to Move to the Move opcodes. You guys are thinking about actually rewriting the contracts in the native languages and maybe making use of some of the unique features there on those blockchains. I think so because the the interesting part is that all these non EVMs they they decide to build non EVMs um, also because they have some sort of a concrete uh, direction they want to take and they want to focus on some sort of uh, um, kind of like. Um, propeller in their uh, ecosystem. For some, it might be, for example, being able to get uh, low cost on transactioning. So it might be, for example, uh, parallelization of, of transactions. Some it might be that they have benefits already of sharding. Um, so it might be just basically certain type of activity uh, in their ecosystem um, that is basically tailored for somehow more um, consumer or mainstream. Um, I do think that uh, Rust-based and Move-based approaches are interesting, and it provides really interesting tooling as well from how to think about the actual implementations uh, from a security standpoint. So they all offer a little bit their own peculiarities, and it brings also a lot of complexity at the same time because we have to think from a complete new perspective of these implementations, peculiarities of the uh, um, the non EVM environments and, and the changes we have to do. Uh, and Aave isn't really uh, the most simple protocol. It's really um, quite um, uh, an architecture and, 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 and it's a lot of work. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I, can, I can see how that would be a lot of work to, to rewrite all those contracts uh, in, in Rust or Move or some other language. Uh, coming back to this. Um, you know, the, the sovereignty topic. I'm really quite curious to understand how you're thinking about this here because Aave has become one of the largest protocols in Ethereum, largest lending protocol by far uh, in, in all of crypto. Yet, you know, the cost of using Ethereum uh, for, for users and, um, and the, uh, the sort of, you know, challenges that you guys need to deal with regards to MEV and, and, and other uh, issues that come with using a generalized purpose chain, you know, could easily be solved by building your own chain, which would allow you to have specific policies around how you capture every MV, uh, doing things like uh, on-chain oracles and like all of these other kind of support functions that a validator set provides. You know, DYDX went down this this uh, this path. Um, I don't know what the kind of status of the maker um, chain pr- idea are. I know at some point they had discussed maybe doing the maker chain. So like. Yeah, just maybe getting your thoughts on like how you think about sovereignty um, for Aave and like what that means, you know, as as being sort of Ethereum aligned, um, what that means for the protocol. Yeah, um, obviously, I think Aave as a community is always kind of like more towards Aave aligned and doing whatever is best for the Aave uh, community and and the, the future of this protocol and its um, principles, obviously like creating more 
access to finance, uh, transparency, and, and just better uh, execution. And I do think that um, if there is a network, uh, which is in, in the plans, and the question is whether that is uh, what kind of pile to what kind of uh, differences, it really creates uh, an amazing uh, design space. Because um, I do think that assets should actually yield how, how, wherever users are holding them. Um, so users can subscribe to certain type of risk or choose not to. Um, and being able to have a, of a network, it actually means that um, there are a lot of benefits where the network can be um, t- tweaked and adjusted towards uh, being very driven by de- DeFi behavior and transactioning. Um, and I think that's a really uh, powerful thing to do. I, I do think that whatever the Ava DAO chooses in terms of like an implementation, uh, I do think that even that design space should be as simplistic as possible. Um, and just to prove what actually a DeFi specific Ava network as a liquidity hub can actually do and benefit for the users, especially the newcomers that don't really mind or care about specifically what network they are, but wants to tap into a good brand and a, and a good product. Um, and with the cross-chain liquidity layer, benefit from all these uh, movements between deployments of Aave across different um, networks. So what I think is going to be um, fascinating is to figure out that uh, delta uh, and design space that is going to be really powerful for the Aave users and the whole ecosystem uh, here. And I think there's a lot of benefits that could be uh, created within uh, our network. So zooming out, when you think about um, DeFi or open finance or however we'll call it then in the year 2030, what will that look like? And how will Aave's role look like within that ecosystem? Yeah, I would say that's um, it's a great question. I think the idea of the Aave 2030 um, proposal, which essentially includes a completely new brand identity, um, you know, taking Aave into a more kind of like approachable, uh, fresh um, look with the V4, bringing new innovation, bringing a lot of flexibility, modular architecture, uh, pays um, not only a good way to um, build iterations, but also support institutions as well coming into the space. And I think that's what's going to happen over the next uh, years. And obviously, of a network bringing efficiency and um, to the whole kind of like a organization of capital and TBL across these networks with cross-chain liquidity layer. I think just looking the upcoming years, um, we have to have infrastructure that is actually really, really um, ready for adoption. Um, and and I'm thinking about mainstream adoption, institutional adoption, and being just a infrastructure that can be used in many different ways uh, with Aave, with Aave DAO, um, or whatever that particular use case uh, is. So I, I think that the idea here is that DeFi is definitely, you know, better way to organize finance and financial infrastructure, but it will take a decade to actually mature because it just needs that maturity um, to scale. And then thinking about the um, Aave Labs uh, role, we want to build the things that we, we we think are necessary. The Aave DAO is growing. There's more contributors there, technically, technical and non-technical contributors. Um, it's probably most interesting DAOs out there at the moment, um, all the way from from the um, early DeFi uh, days. So effectively, uh, hopefully, the other labs kind of like moves more towards other types of initiatives that might be supportive uh, for the DAO uh, or the other ecosystem. But the actual technical architecture is solved to the point that if there is any changes in the future that needs to be made they can be done very locally without upgrading the whole uh, system. Um, I think a lot of inspiration of, of uh, the Linux 
uh, ecosystem, kind of like whole way of how things work in Linux Foundation and how different people can work on different parts and being able to kind of achieve that where certain team can focus on optimizing liquidation strategies, certain teams can be focusing on improving borrow modules um, and, and so forth. I, I think that's the kind of like a big vision here and obviously governance minimization uh, to the extent that governance can be really much an overhead. And I think when it becomes an overhead, it, it removes the kind of uh, design to, to, to people what we basically try to go away from. Um, and as Aave matures, uh, some of these parameters can be immutable uh, down the line and reduce that governance overhead. So I think that's the kind of uh, future I would love to see. How, how do you see the future of stablecoins evolve? I think it's a price point question. So the lower the price point, the more adoption we see and also the UX t- tooling. I actually think that um, for stable coins, especially to get it, getting them into payments, uh, a Validium might be a really good uh, option because you can hit a really low price point for the transaction costs, which is amazing. And with things like smart wallets, um, kind of abstraction, um, embedded wallets even, you can you can have uh, an experience that is really smooth. Um, Stablecoins have taken adoption in places where there's a lot of uncertainty. Argentina is a really great example where stablecoins have taken adoption and there's numerous other uh, examples. And I mean, in general, they work better. Like it's so amazing to send someone uh, go and, and then seeing it on chain directly that it, the transaction landed, you don't need to deal with banks and figure out whether someone received whatever part it is. It's just a kind of like the middle where or like the, the ends the, the 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 ends of the whole stack is, is where it's broken. The offboarding, onboarding, but once we solve that, um, I think we will see a lot of stable coin adoption and especially in uh, payments. So when talking about adoption, you know, one thing that I think about is just the um the 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 demographics or the the kind of persona of crypto and DeFi users. I think it's safe to say that the majority of liquidity in DeFi markets today are crypto native users and institutions. But we haven't I don't think we've seen so much crypto native institutional capital using DeFi. And I think that I feel like there's a lot of uh, potential here for crypto institutional debt uh, to enter DeFi markets, um, specifically in the context of restaking, where protocol owned liquidity will be very useful to build out the the restaking um, kind of market. Um, you know, when it comes to protocol owned liquidity and creating a more fluid market for for that liquidity. You know, a lot of those deal, a lot of these deals now are, I think, are being done kind of, you know, uh, manually with multi sigs, uh, or perhaps even without multi sigs. Um, what's the role that lending markets like Ave might play in um, allowing a lot more crypto native institutional capital to enter lending markets? This is a really really uh, fascinating question because institutions usually have their own kind of uh, needs and requirements and we're still in a phase where uh, the markets in DeFi aren't uh, clear or strong enough for institutions to draw more and more attention uh, into it. And for me to explain what I um, am saying is that if DeFi is overly appealing um, as a market and there is enough clarity how to interact with DeFi, there's tooling and everything, um, it's basically that the institution um, adoption will come just basically from 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 as a market opportunity. Um, and what I think is um, we're in a stage where institutions are describing kind of like their own preferences and needs and figuring out with their compliance teams and figuring out 
with their own kind of like teams of how to manage, you know, funds, custody risk, and various types of uh, new risks. Because DeFi is a leap, leapfrog technology from existing financial uh, technology that we have. It's just, it's so much advanced uh, what we have. Um, and I do think that people will still do paper agreements. People will do a lot of uh, simple, boring stuff um, in closed doors uh, of chain. But it really creates a, a unique kind of like a global borderless uh, market. So once we hit to a, a point where we have more institutions doing these experimentations with their own kind of requirements in collaborating with DeFi projects like, for example, Aave, maybe we see more and more excitement around the space and more education. Um, but I do think that once we hit into a point where uh, the risk profiling is acceptable and maturity is acceptable for institutions, we're just going to see more and more kind of like an inflow. And obviously, the more clear it is on how to interact from regulation perspective, from tooling perspective, um, that will help uh, quite a lot. So now we're in between where we see the most bravest, um, the smartest in institutions, uh, the big brains actually here in DeFi and trying things out, uh, building and experimenting. Um, but we don't yet see actual this kind of like a high inflow. Um, but I do think that will happen over time. That's why I, I mentioned earlier that it, it will take a de decade for DeFi um, to get adoption. Well, um, as we're nearing the end of the podcast here, we've been a, we've gone a little bit long. Uh, I do want to just maybe circle back to this V4 proposal, um, which I think you mentioned earlier is uh, has passed, and uh, that that the payload will be going on chain uh, as we're recording this on on July first. Uh, what's the next steps here, and how can the Alve community get involved? And um, yeah, what, what's your call to action to to the community? Yeah, so we are essentially um, building at the moment. So our work um, has started, and our goal is obviously to to give ongoing monthly reports to the to the Alve DAO and and explain the progress. Um, and we collaborate quite. Uh, a lot with existing DAO uh, participants and, and service providers uh, in terms of brainstorming and, and different areas. So I do think naturally, organically, some of these uh, service providers or DAO members will going to contribute to the uh, V4. And obviously, once the actual implementation is done, the security contributors will going to contribute, and then the risk contributors will contribute as well, whereas they... Um, have to set different type of parameters, um, a lot of these different strategies uh, as well, and kind of like the, the economical pieces uh, together and get ratifications uh, from the DAO. Um, so yeah, it's kind of like a heads down um, type of a uh, phase for us, uh, but we're super excited about this because um, hopefully this moves of a further in terms of innovation institutional adoption, but also brings just better better tools and infrastructure for, for everyone using DeFi. So we're super, super excited about this. And also nice to see that uh, the Avidao has um, a lot of um, uh, blessing for us on, on this proposal, and we're able to do this and, and build it. So it's really appreciated. Cool. Well, Stani, thanks so much for coming on the podcast once again and uh, learned a lot today about uh, Aave v4. Excited to see Aave moving more into a cross-chain, multi-chain world and, and definitely like pushing the boundaries of, of DeFi innovation. Um, so yeah, thanks once again and hopefully we can get you back on uh, in a couple of months when Aave uh, v4 is deployed and uh, you know we'll have ample questions, I think, about, uh, about the progress there. Yeah, definitely. Maybe it takes more than a couple of months, but hopefully we have a test net uh, by then. <laughs> no pressure for us. Good, fantastic. Thank you.